and we're live. It is Tuesday, May 12th, 2020, 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, 2 o'clock p.m. Uh, that other coast time. Uh, we got, it's a weird kind of Boris Johnson news day. Uh, the opposition leader is now more power, uh, more popular than Boris Johnson, according to polls. Boris and the Guardian, is it the Guardian? No, it's the Independent. No, it's the Guardian, is reporting that the Prime Minister's four nations approach to tackling the coronavirus has been dealt a fresh blow after Northern Ireland joined those of Scotland and Wales. All three non-English nations have joined together in rejecting the quote, stay alert slogan and announcing their own plans for easing the lockdown. Meanwhile, uh, in kind of combined Boris Johnson, Kim Jong-un news, Jeremy Clarkson took to Twitter today to take aim at Kim Jong-un, suggesting that he nuke his hairdresser. We are not allowed to have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, we have Tim Miller who's pretty fun. Uh, Tim, welcome to the show. I'm extremely fun. And before you launched this show, I was unaware that you guys were the fun types. I don't, I don't, I didn't know that to be the case. I thought that every this would have been pretty standard for you, you know, reading books, sitting, sitting at home. No, every day at five o'clock for the last 48 days, Kate and I have had a friend on Zoom in front of a live audience with a drink to uh, shoot the shit in lieu of fun. And today that friend is you. It's not like we know you very well or anything, but- uh, but uh, I'll get as personal you are... as you guys want here as we you know move along so we can maybe know each other quite well by the end. Who, who's... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what are you drinking? Um, should I lie? Uh, I'm drinking a nice coffee uh right now um wrong I answer i have a two-year-old so i'm drinking <laughs> nice coffee uh yeah i i um i probably sh i've been i've been doing dabbling in daiquiris though um lately i've been having some banana make at home banana daiquiris i've been doing and um uh miravar rosé so I'll, I'll go for one of those after after i'm out of the hot seat all right uh tim meet kate clonic hi clonic meet tim and uh, Tim, there is an audience here. We sometimes rapture them into the conversation to ask questions. Right. Um, but let me give a little bit of background about Tim for those of you who don't know him. Tim uh, was uh, the one of the spokesmen for the Republican National Committee. He was a uh, Republican operative. Uh, is that a fair description? Dark arts oh. kind of practitioner? I mean, I was maybe the. We the get in trouble when we call people operatives on the show, Ben. I know. I was. I, I'm no. I'm a recovering operative. Um, unlike uh, you know our friend James Carville, who still wears that with pride. I'm a recovering operative now, but I was certainly a dark arts practitioner. I started America Rising, um, which was, uh, you know, back in the more mild day pre-Trump days, probably the chief. Uh, practitioners of the dark arts in the Republican Party for a little while. Just to be right. clear, sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm so just to be clear, it's like the dark arts and like Republicans. Is that still like kind of like rat fucking from like Nixon days or something? Like, what is the dark arts exactly? Yeah, it's it's so it was. I think rat fucking for the longest time. We tried to corporatize it at America Rising, so it was kind of like rat fucking. I mean, there was a puckishness to it, but um, it was more just. Um, uh, I think trying to operationalize opposition research and tracking and all of that and, you know, put it all in one place, easily searchable, you know, make it faster for the modern era. Uh, I think that Steve Bannon um, and, and Trump and, and Trump's, you know, uh, coterie of, of freaks uh, uh, repopularized the uh, rap, the less corporate, um, more uh, uh, clandestine rat fucking, which I think is now back ascendant within the party. Yeah, I would say that's not like it, it doesn't count as rat fucking if it's corporate. Yeah. But you worked, uh, I mean, with 
a lot of what we've come to think of as the bad guys. I mean, you were Sean Spicer's deputy. You worked under Reince Priebus. <laughs> you really did I mean, your research on me, Ben. Yeah, that's right. No, I I've just heard you lots of times talk about it. Um, and then um, all of those people became the Trumpists. Mm -hmm. And you are kind of the only one of them who went never Trump, right? Yeah, that's pretty much right. I mean, at the, certainly at the RNC proper, um, uh, everybody got gobbled up by Trump world. Um, there is, I, 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 sh I would be remiss to not note, um, I do have a friend, Kirsten Kukowski, who was a press secretary um, at the time at the RNC, and she resisted Trumpism. I, she didn't sort of go my route. I think she went the normal route of just sort of becoming a regular human again, um, rather than engaging in this absurdity. But yeah, I mean, that, it's true. And we were the, all there for the um, autopsy uh, that you got the famous Republican autopsy that Donald Trump, uh, you know, used as toilet paper uh, in, a, in his path to victory. But uh, it's interesting, the, um, the crew that did the autopsy was, was Reince and Sean, as you've mentioned. Ari Fleischer uh, was one of the consultants that came in to do it. Uh, Henry Barber, a son of Haley. Um, Elise Stefanik. Uh, of uh, uh, now gone full Trumpy fame in the House of Representatives, uh, myself and Sally Bradshaw, who is Jeb's consultant, who, who's a fellow Never Trumper and is now a librarian. So um, it is interesting to kind of look back on those times that we all, the seven of us, had a pretty aligned view of what the party needed to do as far as to reach out to young people and diversify, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then Trump happened and, um, uh, I, I guess I, th I don't think I would be out of place to say that only me and Sally kind of maintained that view. Okay, so forgive my ignorance on this, Please. but you said autopsy, and I am got really hopeful for a second that you meant like an actual, but like, what you, I'm, I, 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 like that's autopsy. a terrible thing to say. I don't actually wish that. It was just too easy a joke. But um, uh, what do you, what do you mean exactly? Was, yeah, sorry. It was the election. So in tw after the 2012 election, after Obama won, the, RN, the RNC, which I, I was the uh, communications guy there at the time, uh, with Spicer. Um, basically did a review of like, how do we get our ass kicked so bad? You know, and it's like, what are the lessons we need to learn? And like the main lessons that, that we came up with were, you know, there were certain just kind of boring technical things that the committee needed to do better with data and all that. Um, but in addition to that, uh, the committee need, you know, we needed to uh, uh, do better with women, do better with young voters, do better with Hispanics. Um, the theory of the case being that we kind of had maxed out uh, and had done about as good as we were going to do with white voters. Uh, Romney did as, as well with right voters as Reagan did in his landslide in 84. And so um, uh, in some ways, um, uh, we were obviously wrong about that. Donald Trump squeezed the juice, uh, you know, squeezed the just ends of that He just locked him right up. Yeah, every, every non-college white voter out there um, into his camp. Um, but, uh, but that, that was basically kind of the review that we had put out, um, and, and the plan forward, uh, which nobody listened to, uh, mm -hmm. which worked out for them politically. Um, but, but hopefully it was making some of them have trouble sleeping at night. Maybe, probably not though. So that is actually what I want to talk to you about. Yeah. Cause you have spent, and for those of you who don't read Tim's stuff in, in the bulwark, uh, in Rolling Stone, a uh, bunch of places. Uh, uh, it is really searing stuff, and um, and uh, I don't think there's anybody else writing quite like you right now. Which actually makes me think that all this time, when you were kind of a messaging guy for uh, campaigns and being a flack and whatnot, you were kind of missing your calling. Which is, in your heart, you're an essayist. Uh, and you're an essayist who's fundamentally about looking inside of other people's souls. Um, and um, whether it's the collective soul of, the, of certain groups of people or whether it's individuals, and we'll talk about some of them, uh, I'm, I, you know, you're really like, quite good at sort of imagining the interior monologues of other people. And so I, 
I'm blushing am, a little bit, Ben. Thank you. Well, that's gay. You know, you know. I have imposter syndrome. You know, this is I'm new to the, to this whole this whole thing about being a writer. So this is very kind of you. Thank you. Um, I, it's Christopher very... Hitchens would say you just have to like let it go, drop some acid, and take a shot of whiskey. I, I think. wish again. I've got the two year old. Trust me, I wish <laughs> I could just let that all go and drop. You put some the two year old in a closet. That's okay. like. <laughs> 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 so, so my question is, what's the difference between you and all the other people who wrote the autopsy, right? You guys worked on it together in your hearts. You have similar view. You had a similar analysis of 2012, but Donald Trump comes along and you say, no way, no how. And Donald Trump comes along and they say, no way, no how, until the moment that they say, okay, all right, uh, that way, that how, and, uh, and reject a lot of what they had previously believed. Uh, what, yeah. what is the, the difference in psychology between the person who says, fuck it, no way, and the person who says, fuck it, way? <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, before I analyze them, I'll just give you a quick uh, self analyst, a self analysis to show some uh, uh, um, awareness of my own weaknesses in that regard, because I've thought about this a lot. And, you know, if Ted Cruz had been the nominee, like, I probably would have landed on the Spicer side of things. Now, not on the side of like, I'm going to make absurd lies about Ted Cruz having the biggest, of, you know, inauguration of all time, but, but land on the Ted Cruz side of things is like, eh. I think that this is a person I disagree with on a lot of things, but but fundamentally it's defensible um, for for me to go continue my career and work for him. Um, I, I don't I think that doesn't really say that great of things about me, really. Um, but, would you uh, now? I hope that that no or no. or was That's never Trumpism a kind of gateway drug to a kind of break with the populist hard right. Yeah, it was a gateway drug and, and it was some self-reflection. It, it, it created a ton of self-reflection. Just and looking back about things that I, you know, look, I, I was never a populist. I worked for all the rhinos, like for John Huntsman and John McCain and all these guys. But but still, in order to win and Jeb, you know, Jonathan Swan tagged me on this on Twitter recently. He's like, you know, you're all on your horse now, but you used to pitch things to Breitbart. And I was like, yeah, guilty as charged. You know, and I knew that how and I knew that Breitbart was trafficking in very dark stuff. And I wasn't sending them dark stuff, but I was trying to get their audience to be attracted to my candidates on other in other ways, right? And 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 I think had Ted won the nomination, I probably would have still done this. So in some ways, at least in my personal growth as a human, um, this has been good for me. Um, I, I think that what was the difference between me and some of those other people is whether it's um, the fact that I'm gay, whether it's the fact that um, I'm an adopted kid. I, I don't know, uh, but I have a per, like from a personal standpoint, I think that I I saw you know the damage uh, that was being done, and and I I just I just felt very personally how gross and disgusting Donald Trump's behavior was and what the impact it has on people, and, and that just so far overwhelmed and it, it could, didn't even it never even crossed my mind to be like oh yeah I'll just go with it. I mean, he was so far out of bounds in, the, in a lot of those regards. And, and for whatever reason, I, I just think a lot of those other folks made the calculation that I would have made with Cruz, which was being in the mix is more important. Feeling important is more important. Um, being Lindsey Graham and having the president call you, being able to go home to your friends from high school and tell them about how you know all the juice. All that stuff was more important to them than their disagreements. Um, and, and so, and then over time, you begin to rationalize that, right? It becomes tribal. You begin to see all the, what's, you know, you look at the worst examples as, as, you know, President Bush said in that speech of what the op, of what the opposition is doing. And you look at the best intentions of what people around Trump are doing. And, and, and I, I watched this from my friends who went along with it, who went from either being ironically for him to reluctantly for him to like, don't you really think the media is out to get him? <laughs> and like, it just happens slowly, slowly, slowly. And, and so I think that luckily for me, I had some cl a clarity that, you know, that, that access was not worth the, the, um, the damage that Trump was causing. And so I, I feel like 
the nice thing about the people at the bulwark not just me but other folks who are writing for the bulwark and the dispatch and the lincoln project is we have like a little bit of a clarity about this that we you know since we've given up caring about the, the access side i have a i i just kind of so to tag on to like this i think is super fascinating and i love as ben knows kind of asking this question to people especially people who have like kind of um have like you know um politics that are maybe antithetical to their identity politics um, or yeah. something else. Um, but I also just think that it's fascinating. Uh, I just like to know generally, like what was like, where did you grow up? And like, what was your, what was that like? And do you think that that kind of put you like, what, like what kind of drew you to the Republican party initially, like way back in the day? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, my family's all from St. Louis, big Catholic family, um, uh, huge Catholic family. Uh, we moved to Denver when I was when I was in middle school. Did you know the Schlafleys? Um, no, I, I mean I know the Schlafleys, but okay. I don't know the Schlafleys. Um, the uh, uh, so we moved to Denver when I was in middle school, and my my parents were like, my mom was non political basically, and my dad was Republican in the way that a business guy is Republican, but he wasn't. They, they didn't have like a po politics passion in, it, in the way I did. Um, I, and I, I don't know what drew me to it exactly initially, but I had it from a very young age. Um, and I think that, you know, my dad was a working class, came from a working class family and like made it big. And I think that my experience with, with that, like my personal experience was very much, I, I related to this idea that, you know, he shouldn't be, you know, getting squeezed, right? By an incompetent, you know, government, um, uh, you know, I, I, my, my feelings about that have dulled over time as I get, uh, as I get, as I uh, experience other rich people, um, but who I think probably deserve to be squeezed. And you um, realize that your dad was maybe not like the top, top echelon of like, like who people were coming after with taxes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that is true. But then I, I think in, just in general, I was always drawn to, you know, kind of the classical liberal, you know, views, free, free markets, free people, um, uh, you know, a, a, a country that was a shining city on a hill, a country that respected pluralism, a country where every person um, had the uh, uh, ability or, or was given the opportunity to reach their own potential, where like the government, nobody should put any ceilings on that. Uh, and that by, you know, kind of giving them the, um, uh, uh, the opportunity to do that and, and, to, and to do it on their own was the best solution. All, all of that stuff appealed to me. And, and I think that is going back to Ben's question. Another thing about Trump that was just so gross, right, is that he was just a total rejection of all of that. And, and, and um, you know, I don't, I don't have like a particular immigrant story, but I was always drawn to the, you know, kind of idealized American immigrant story. Um, and, you know, that was the Republican, you know, party that I grew up in. Um, and, and so, you know, from that to, to this um, has been, uh, you know, I, I recognize that that was not a widely held view within the party, but I thought it was a more widely held view than it turned out to be. So we have a, a really interesting question from right. the sum who, uh, 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 which dovetails with a lot of your work, actually. So the sum, the floor is yours. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you very much. I agree with uh, Mr. Wittes about your writing talent. Um, I've read some of your pieces and been very impressed. Um, thank you so much. I don't have my question in front of me, but my basic gist was that I attended the impeachment hearings in DC and Elise Stefanik was one of my biggest disappointments. I'm an independent. I've never been a registered Republican or Democrat, but I definitely lean left for my pro-choice positions. Um, and she seemed to me to be a really smart, impressive, sort of moderate progressive Republican that I could rely on to be a responsible Republican, the kind that I used to believe in, the kind that some of my parents were. Um, and then at the impeachment hearing, I was just shocked. So I guess my question is, does she actually, or not maybe just her, I don't need you to sure, divulge any personal rep relationship, but I mean, people like her or her specifically, do they actually believe 
in Donald Trump? Or do, do they just ride that train to get what they need politically? I'm totally in YOLO mode, the sum. So I'm happy to just do personal uh, conversations about people. I don't care anymore. Sorry, Ben, were you going to chime in? Yeah, no, no. I was just going to say, uh, you know, uh, that question plums the depths of a lot of the essays that Tim has been writing and yeah. uh, about uh, Elise Stefanik, for example, but also about Dan Crenshaw and uh, also about collections of people, uh, particularly the the anti anti Trump folks. And so, I mean, answer the question. Take take whatever, as they say in Congress, the gentleman should take whatever time he needs. Uh, answer the question with respect to Stefanik, but also answer the broader psychological question that it begs, which is about a group of people much larger than Stefanik. Yeah. And relatedly. Does, I think that you could probably weave in why Sean Spicer decided to go on Dancing with the Stars. Okay. Like, I just, I feel like okay. it's tangentially related. Yeah, <laughs> like, just okay. it'll, it'll all in there. I'm just going to put, I'm going to tie all the <laughs> together for you guys. Um, the unified field theory, man. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a fun anecdote about Elise that was, was shared with me by um, a friend uh, who she, um, uh, she sent some tweet the other day that was like, I'm going to go on Trump TV today to talk about how the globalists are trying to take down President Trump. And, and this guy said that she that when he had met Elise about a year or two ago at one of these stupid D.C. events um, and he asked her to recommend a book that she likes that, you know, reflects her uh, her worldview. Uh, she recommended to him America in Retreat, the new isolationism by Brett Stevens. <laughs> so like, I mean, this is just, it just shows you the absurdity of this. So, like that at some level, no, she doesn't actually believe this in a deep, in a, in a deep way. She's not an immigration restrictionist. She's not, you know, uh, uh, somebody who, who cheers on the president when he tells uh, uh, you know, black women who are born here, they should go back to where they came from. Um, but uh, I, I do think that what she and the other anti-anti-Trumpers have come to believe is that um, Donald Trump is flawed, but he's kind of a joke. And he's flawed, um, but it's not really that big of a deal because it's better to have a flawed person who's a conservative running the government that lets us get our judges and lets us get people I like be you know, Betsy DeVos in the education department and Wilbur Ross in commerce and let's Mitch McConnell do his things that 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 Trump's worst instincts really don't actually harm anybody. They're just him venting. Um, and that the real evil that our country faces is uh, the journalists um, who are unfair to conservatives like Elise and that and that Jim Acosta um, is the great threat that faces the country and that Donald Trump is a minor threat that faces the country. And, and, I, and I, I don't know that Elise would say, I, yes, I agree with that um, explicitly, but, but I think that is the psychology behind it, that, that the group think, um, um, you know, you forget this is not, you know, Washington, even before the pandemic, um, is no longer a place where there is this kind of great you know, con, uh, mingle, commingling of ideas. You know, Elise Stefanik's life is she talks, she goes to House Republican conference meetings with other Republicans where they complain about the media, how they're treating them. She talks to staffers who complain about how the media is treating them. She talks, she goes to fundraisers where she talks to donors. Like, like she is not exposed, you know, getting, you know, exposed with, um, to, uh, to what these other folks are thinking. And so increasingly you just shut it, shut, shut down. Um, anything that threatens, you know, the kind of safe, cozy space that you've put yourself in. And so I, I think that, that a lot of those, these folks have just kind of walked slowly down this path, um, um, you know, thanks to tribalism, thanks to groupthink, and, and thanks to really just um, opportunism, right? I mean, it, it's, it's like anything else, you know, Ben, um, you guys know this, that we're all, by nature, we want to be part of a team. You know, like I, so I signed up to write for the Bulwark because I'm, I'm longtime friends with Sarah Longwell and I know these folks. I didn't know Charlie Sykes before this, right? Like if I'm on Twitter and somebody says something mean about Charlie Sykes, like a year ago, I would have been like, that's kind of mean, but I'd ignore it, 
right now i'm like oh my gosh these guys come out lie charlie down sykes. in traffic my for charlie sykes right i'm gonna defend him i'm gonna go to the mat for him and so i think this happens right this or you put on your jersey and you're like even though i don't really agree with all this little stuff over here about trump he's on my team and the real enemy of the people is the guys that are are exaggerating how bad he is or whatever um and over time that just sort of builds and builds and builds the resentment against the media builds and builds and builds the resentment against the left builds and builds and builds to the point where you do start to believe this stuff. Um, you know, maybe not a hundred percent of it, but, um, but you, you start to believe it on balance. Do you think that that's true? I don't, I want Kevin to ask his question, but do you think that that's also true of the left? Like, I just know some people who are on the left that are just as like, um, just as kind of like, just rabid about like believing what they believe and not taking anything else in. I just feel like the tribalism is to a certain extent on both sides. And like, it's so strong and without any self sense of self-awareness almost. Yeah, I don't think it's evenly distributed uh, on both sides, but it certainly appears on both sides for sure. Um, I think as evidenced by the fact that like, you know, Joe Biden just won a massive primary victory, I, I think shows that there's a level of pragmatism at least, uh, on the left coalition um, that didn't exist on the right coalition. But um, uh, look, I, I definitely think it does. I mean, I, I, I um, you know, if you look at like, who are those guys, the brothers, the Krasenstein guys, you know, I and mean, there is definitely this strain on the left of kind of resistance grift where, and, and, you know, this, and, and by the way, this, um, you know, the fact that this exists exacerbates this problem on the right, because it gives people on the right the ability to say, see, 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 these guys aren't fair. And so they get more entrenched and then the left gets more entrenched. So I do think this has an effect uh, where they, it plays against each other. But yeah, I mean, I think that I don't, I actually don't really care that much if there are resistance people that exaggerate Donald Trump's crimes and offenses from time to time. Like, I just don't think that's that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things, but it can Why be not? a problem. Why not? I mean, truth is truth. If, if there are resistance grifters and there are, yeah. um, uh, and some of them are pretty pernicious in the sense of, yeah. uh, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not going to name names here because- sure. Uh, why bother? But, you know, one of the reasons I created and perpetuated the baby cannon thing was to try to distinguish between real journalism and bullshit yeah. and to give people a very simple heuristic that amounted to a person with some reasonable authority saying, read this. And if baby cannon doesn't say boom, that means I don't really think you need to read this one, right? Yeah. But if Baby Cannon says, boom, read it, right? And like something really simple that separates the Louise Menches from the New York Timeses. Yeah, um, I agree with why that. Isn't, I, is it, why isn't it important? Yeah, no, it's, I, I maybe should have chosen my words more carefully. Truth is truth and truth is important. I think that long-term, the left does have a potential problem with people who are not speaking honestly to, 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 to them. And, and I think that it eventually, you know, that will not necessarily result in somebody that is as pernicious as Donald Trump, but it will result in, um, I think a lot of some of the same things that you saw on the right, which is expectations game totally being out of whack. I mean, if you look at the proposals that some of the Democratic candidates put forth, like there's just no way that any of this is going to happen. And that creates distrust between the elites and the base. So I do think that lying to your readers or lying to your constituents does matter. My point was, I just think given the, what we're facing right now, like the urgency of now, that like, it's just hard for me to get my dander up about the Krasenstein brothers, you know, given the threats that are happening from the current president. But, uh, but, but I, I don't want to diminish the fact that, um, that the left is it, you know that there that there is a danger of of falling down a similar rabbit hole where um, there is a kind of band of you know populist left wing you know provocateurs who have no um, uh, uh, concern for the truth, and then you have establishment democratic politicians who, in order to appeal to those people, like we used to do with Breitbart, you know, fudge the truth, lie, throw them the bone, throw them some red meat, you know, eventually you know, the, the provocateurs eat the establishment, right? Like mm -hmm. eventually you give in, you give in, give in. And so I, I think that is something that is a problem for the left um, that is coming. 
but I, I just, it's just, I, I just find it to be, I don't see it as like an, the urgent matter that, that we see on the right. Kevin Donahue, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ben. Hey, Tim. Uh, I also really like your writing style. Um, I wanted Thanks, to ben. ask you about uh, your assessment of, of Joe Biden's campaign. Um, I like Joe in the primary and everything I read about him in the media and amongst the people that I talked to about politics indicated he was this really weak candidate. And so he really surprised me that he won. And I was, I was happy about that. Um, but now I don't know what to think about you know, what is his strengths and weaknesses are as a candidate. And I don't know, you know, really to trust the polls right now or uh, put faith in those. So uh, how do you evaluate Joe's uh, strength as a candidate? And, and what are the weaknesses that he needs to kind of preempt um, as the, the general election campaign uh, kicks in here? Yeah, look, I think that there is good bedwetting and concern when it comes to Biden, and then there's unhelpful bedwetting and concern. Um, you know, I think that it's reasonable to be concerned that he's not going to win. So, um, you know, there's no sense to be complacent, and I don't want to argue for complacency. I also think a lot of the nitpicking about him and his campaign is absurd and ridiculous. Um, I, I don't I, I, I don't think that, you know, in the political environment that we're in now, like this election is going to be about Donald Trump. That's good for Joe Biden. Like Joe Biden does not need to, you know, put himself out there any more than he has to. Like this idea that like Joe Biden's hiding in the basement and that he should be, you know, everywhere doing, you know, YouTuber interviews and, you know, doing the in lieu of a fun pod and, and you know, being everywhere. I just like don't agree with that. I, as far as I'm concerned, he could just spend three weeks in the heart of Africa uh, on a mission trip and just kind of go away for a little while. And that wouldn't really matter to his campaign one way or the other. Um, his strengths as a candidate, his main strength as a candidate is that there are three groups of people that matter in this election. Uh, Obama, Trump voters, white working class folks who switched, people like me, um, rhinos in the suburbs that voted probably for Evan McMullen or Gary Johnson last time or held their nose for Trump. Um, and uh, 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 voters, largely voters of color and young voters who didn't turn out. Joe Biden does well with all those people, except for young voters. Like he does disproportionately better than, than the other candidates with all of the key swing categories. So, so he is constitutionally, he's a good candidate. Um, his problem, you know, his potential weaknesses, I think, come in a debate setting, you know, with Trump, where, I mean, that's just a Trump debate as somebody who's been there um, for Jeb. Uh, is a is a weird beast that's really hard to prepare for in the best circumstances. Biden, obviously, I, I don't think is at the top of his game when it comes to debating. Um, so that's something that gives me a little bit of concern. I'm curious when when you say that um, about, do you think Biden is at this point essentially a uh, generic Democrat? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, it's generic Democrat in the polling sense, right? That he's basically somebody who's fundamentally objectionable to very few people. He's, uh, and so when you say the name Joe Biden, it's just like a reason, it's like saying, like putting on the ballot, some reasonable Democrat. <laughs> and the less he says, uh, the better, because anything he says could piss somebody off. You know, if he, if he talks, he might say something stupid, but if he just stays as, you know, some reasonable seeming Democrat, uh, that is a winning position. I mean, he's got, I, being some reasonable Democrat's not a bad place to be right now. So, um, you know, I, I, no, you know, consultant is ever going to, you know, make more money by saying do less. Uh, but I, I think that there's a good argument for saying do but less. There's like my, I mean, like my parents who are um, more Mo Rockefeller Republicans for like most of their life and like yeah. also just like despise Trump right now. My dad just, his favorite line is that like he'd vote for a bowl of cabbage soup over like, <laughs> over like, I don't know why he picked that particular yeah, why cabbage? item. It smells because it smells. I don't know. Like um, but like, but like basically, I think that's right. May, the closer to Biden, that Biden can be to like a bowl of cabbage soup, like is like just fine. Like he doesn't even have to be likable. Like no one has to want to eat him. Like they're just like, he just has to like be unobjectionable and like sus like, and the sustenance you need in a crisis. Uh, and so like, I kind of, I think that it's, it's actually, now that you guys are talking about it, kind of a good metaphor actually. <laughs> 
I think that's right. My ca- only caveat is, you know, there is a turnout game here um, and, and his campaign is going to have to navigate the challenge of, how, of motivating people to turn out. You know, it, there is in 2018, just being just giving the middle finger to Donald Trump was enough to motivate enough people in an off year to have a good time for the Democrats. The Democrats didn't have like this great inspiring overarching message in the midterms. It was basically just screw this guy. Um, that didn't work for Hillary for a variety of reasons. So I do think it's an open question about whether that works for Biden. And, um, and, and I think that it's something that his campaign um, apparatus like, needs to be really focused on is, is how, do we, how do we deal with the energy side? Because the persuasion side, like I said, I, I, I don't think that he needs to concern himself. It, it, I, I agree with you, Ben. I think that he more has to concern himself with turning people off on persuasion side. Like I think he's like where he's situated in the electorate right now is, is a good place to be as far as appealing to the types of voting groups he needs to appeal to. But it's like, how do you, how do you move up the dial on the, on the intensity side? That's going to be his question. I want to get to John really quickly, but just one last thing, which is just kind of the idea that like, if you do have kind of this trade-off between people of like, just kind of, you said like, these are the voters that they need to get and everything else. And you kind of like, you know, and I completely agree with you, except that that analysis presumes some level of normalcy to this election. And I just think that the, uh, the black box of what voting day is going to look like is such an unknown is to put Nate Silver out of a job if he was like actually worth his weight in gold. That's, that's I mean, another thing that the they should be really concerned about because there's this weird conventional wisdom in Washington that's like vote by mail is going to help the Democrats win because of better turnout naturally helps Democrats. Like, is that necessarily true? No. I mean, who, who, who uses, the, like, firstly, there are a lot more non-college white people in the country that don't vote than there are urban, young, college educated, you know, white voters and, or, you know, voters of color. Like, there are a lot more in, in category one. So if you just raise turnout among everybody, that actually is going to help Trump, not the Democrats. And then secondly, out of those categories, who's more comfortable using the mail? Uh, you know, it seems to me rural, exurban, non-college white people are more comfortable using the mail. Than, That's actually than, not you know, true. So Nate personally people. was on, he was talking about this, that like basically like that minority like populations traditionally don't trust the mail system for their vote. They think that it's not trustworthy. So right. yeah. No, but, the, that's, but that's Tim, that's exactly yeah, Tim's totally point. But yeah. yeah, so no, oh, okay, sorry. You were, at, okay, sorry. Yeah, like, that are was you, the point this, that I was making. Yes, I think of course. the election could help could help Republic, could help Trump. Um, Precisely, not yes. To say that we shouldn't do it. I mean, I think we obviously need to have a vote by mail system to give everybody options, but that's a challenge, big, a bigger challenge for Biden to overcome than Trump by you know, educating his voters about how to do that. Um, and like the conventional wisdom for some reason in DC is the opposite. All right, John Bordeaux has a question that hey, is actually the question hey, that I was uh, thinking of asking you in light of some of the things you've been saying. So I'll just let John ask it instead awesome. of me. Thank you, very kind. Um, yeah, I was listening with some interest in your, your growth journey since the autopsy and kind of how you, how you advanced since then. But a lot of what I'm hearing here, and I've read some of your work and I, I love it. I haven't seen read enough, I'll go back and, and check more. How much of this journey is rethinking some of your prior positions and how much it really is an inflection point of responding to Trump? And I, I'll ask the question this way. If the 25th Amendment option were pulled somehow, and President Pence cleaned house of the more deplorable uh, elements, would you go to work for him? No, no. Pence is so far gone. I mean, all these guys are so far gone with the way that they've debased themselves. Uh, it just makes me, honestly, it makes me sick. Um, so to the first part of the question, it's a good question. And, um, and I've done a lot of reflection on this. I think that's another thing that makes me different from the other guys. Back to your first question, Ben, I don't know that a lot of them have done a whole lot of reflection at this time. They just sort of have moved forward through inertia as, and done what, what they would have done if anybody won. But um, I, I think Frum wrote this, um, um, another good, uh, uh, certainly an essayist that I could aspire to. Um, he, uh, he wrote um, that, that the Trump era just re-changed his priorities more than changed his policy views. And, and I think that's true for a lot of people. Uh, it's certainly true for me. Um, I, like, as I was joking about earlier, like what the top income tax bracket rate is, is like no longer really that big of a priority for me. <laughs> like, I, I guess on balance, like I haven't really changed my views that much on, on taxation and regulations. 
but I, I just like it's not a it's not that big of a priority for me. And part of the reason was because back in the before times, I did not you know recognize that like basic things like um, believing that everybody should be allowed to be in this country regardless of what their religion is, and you know um, um, treating everybody with respect no matter what their race is, and you know not having somebody who is you know, a kleptocrat, like that is lining his own pockets as the White House, as the president is, is you know, um, these are all things that I did not realize I had to prioritize. They weren't on my sheet because I thought that was like a baseline thing. Everybody just agreed with that was, I was wrong about that. Um, and so I have, um, I've kind of greatly reprioritized what's important to me. And, and a lot of the things that, that I was always kind of kind of classic or whatever, separate from the Republican party on, you know, being more, uh, you know, uh, promoting diversity, you know, so being an immigration dove, things of this nature are, are like all the th things that, that the Republicans have left me on. Um, so I, I really think that um, the, only, uh, um, the only major thing that I've, I, I, I've changed my views on is I've, I've softened on, um, on, on, on fiscal issues, just really caring about them. And I've kind of, I was always kind of a squish on guns, but I've, I've gotten increasingly squishy on guns as I get older too. So I, I, I'm, I'm curious, cause I, I've actually gone through a kind of similar, I've never been a partisan. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit different in that regard, but I do think that there were, for example, for me, it is the battle against the civil libertarians, which I, used to think of as one of my central political salient political characteristics that right like that i was uh you know that i believed government needed certain authorities i still do believe that government needs certain authorities in order to uh function and that civil libertarians of a certain variety were really interested in disabling those authorities. And I kind of thought of those authorities as relatively non-political. They're just like the ability to, you know, kill terrorists or prosecute right. them or, right. And now it's not that I don't believe those things anymore. I do. Um, and it's not that I still don't disagree with a lot of civil libertarians about it. It's just that I think the question is deeply unimportant right. compared to the question <laughs> of like what unites uh, for example, me and Jamil Jaffer, the, 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 the great civil liberties litigator who uh, I used to be like, think of as a sparring partner. And now like we joke about it, like, you know, what wouldn't he represent me on? And what wouldn't I like, you know, and, um, and yeah, I was so joking I, with the old Obama spokesman, Ben LaVolt, who's a friend of mine. And he was like, remember when you were so mad at me about Solyndra and high-speed rail? And I was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. you know I was actually right about Solyndra and high-speed rail, but it's kind of like, who gives a fuck about, about right. like so, that so, right now, you know? So that's so th that that's my question is, is it that we were all focused on unimportant questions or was it that um, that the those were objectively important questions. It's just that the ground has moved enough that they are no longer questions that anybody should be focused on. Like, should we aspire to a time when you and Ben LeBolt go back to fighting about that? And, you know, and, and uh, Jamil Jaffer and I go back to fighting about things? Or is it basically that there has been a realignment of the of the political structure such that um, like we're we're allied the people who are allied on these pre-political questions that is the new political constellation and we should be comfortable with that as a long term uh, uh, a long-term reality. You mean we throw out tribalism and decide to base our like our identities on moral principles? God forbid. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. no, I mean, I, I like so that I, I actually mean to be a little bit more respectful of the question in the sense that like, you know, yeah, there was a time when it seemed like it was really important whether the top marginal tax rate was 39% or 35%. And then we grew up and threw away childish things, right? And now we actually have to have an argument about whether everybody should be able to vote. And yeah. like, that's a more important question. And so 
let's embrace the fact that we are all on fundamentally the same side of the most important questions. And there are a lot of things we're gonna disagree about and that's perfectly fine. Yeah, I kind of chuckle and I get this a lot from Democrats um, who I'm aligned with on stuff now where they're like, I just can't wait to go back to being able to fight with you over you know, whatever taxes and regulation. I, I think that we're, we're seeing a, not a permanent, nothing's permanent in politics, but a, a relatively significant political shift that is gonna happen for a while. And I think the ground has shifted under our feet. Um, I think it's continuing to shift. I, I, I think that it's, there, there will be a shift within the, the democratic coalition that is coming that will kind of impact this as well. I don't exactly know how that's gonna shake out, but, but that's coming um, for sure. And um, I, I think that we'll be fighting, especially if you look at, you know, what's happening around the world, you look at what's happening in Europe. I, it just seems to me like that we're going to be fighting on these fundamental things for a while and that the pre-political questions um, are, are going to you know, kind of land in the realm of, of unimportant within kind of our big defining political debates but you know we'll still exist in washington you know among kind of a lobbyist class <laughs> the, among the swamp that, that fights this stuff out i mean it's not like we're going to stop doing those you know doing those things and that there will still be you know some partisan differences there but i think that the fundamental um you know changes uh, are going to be um uh, uh you know are going to remain um where they're where everybody having the right to vote just sort of these populist um, you know, demagogic, um, you know, fault lines are going to continue. The question is, the, the big concerning question for me is, is what happens if, if both sides end up, you know, ha being, you know, populist and demagogic and, and anti-democratic, um, you know, in, in different ways, of course. Um, and, and uh, you know, then, then what does it, what, how does, you know, how does our politics respond to that? Um, because I think that probably our numbers, those of us who are on the, the side of, uh, you know, these fundamental norms, um, I think we're in the minority. <laughs> I don't think that there's a plurality for norms out there. Although I think the, the performance of Biden in the primary is actually is the single most encouraging thing that has happened on For behalf sure. of that in a, in a while. So we have a bunch of questions in the queue. We have 13 minutes left, though. We okay, kind rapid, of, fire, uh, rapid fire. So, so let's, uh, let's just like run through the queue. Michael Waxenberg with the lowercase w, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Ben. I do have a question that builds on the previous discussion. First, I, I just want to thank Tim for uh, his piece on taking Obamagate seriously. I could not have suspended logic and proportion that thoroughly and waded through that much crap myself. <laughs> so I appreciate him doing it for us. Um, I, I basically have a multiple choice question though. Awesome. Uh, basically, I'm curious what the, the target state is for you leading never Trumpers. I mean, are you gonna try to reclaim the Republican party and deprogram your voters? Uh, do you see a hostile takeover of the Democratic party from the center right? maybe a third party that occupies the center or something else, or E, none of the above, because you have to excise the cancer and worry about these big questions later. I think probably E, none of the above. I, I see us as being kind of like the Perot Democrats um, who, you know, who just are without a party for a while. I, I, I really just don't, I, I don't see a feasible path to taking back over the Republican party, um, especially given the shift in the demographics of the party since we, you know, I mean, a lot, part of Joe, not the whole story of Joe Biden's victory, but a part of the victory of Joe Biden is a lot of people that used to be at least swing voters, if not soft Republicans, voted for him. And they're gone now, I think, for a while. So I think taking back over the Republican Party is hopeless. Hostile takeover of the Democratic Party is probably hopeless. Third party is probably hopeless. So I think that we are uh, people without a home for maybe a decade or two. And, and then we'll, there will be certain opportunities and moments, I think, like you saw with Perot in 92 and with Trump, unfortunately, in 2020, where, you know, that coalition matters in a real way. What about being the conservative flank of the Democratic Party? Potent, I mean, people talk about that. Um, I think that is a more realistic outcome, frankly, at this as, as we stand today because of the suburb, the large suburb shift to the Democrats. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't, there's not a whole lot of um, opportunity for that, or there's not a whole lot of interest in that in the Democratic Party. I also think there's regional solutions. Like, I've thought that there could be a, a pretty effective group of us 
that kind of focus on running Republicans like Charlie Baker in Massachusetts and, and Democrats like John Bell Edwards in Louisiana. Um, and I think that there's a path there um, because of the polarization in the country that, that has opened up. Um, but, but in the national elections, we're hopeless. All right, E. Lindbergh, the floor is yours. Thank you, it's Eileen is the first name. Nice to meet you all. This has been a great experience, first time in. My, Welcome. My, my first question, and I'll only ask one, but that came to mind when you all started was, what is the fundamental difference between a Republican mindset and a Democratic mindset? Because I've got this big rift in my family. We're all got plenty of money. I just don't get it. So if you have any thoughts about that. Oh, what do man. you think, Tim? That's a deep question. Um, what is the what is the defining rift in the uh, rich family between the Republican mindset? Uh, I, I think that it is a kind of collectivist mindset versus an individualist is probably one of the prime things. Um, and then uh, I think that there's also nowadays that was kind of maybe the old divide. And I think the new divide is like whether you see yourself as uh, uh, culturally aligned with the elites or anti-elite. Um, you know, whether you kind of, uh, whether you liked the smart, cool kid and the smart kids in your college class or whether you kind of hated them all and resented them, and, you know, now want, want them to be embarrassed. Um, I think that's another dividing line these days. It's more visceral than policy. I want to say that the smart kids were never the cool kids where I went to high school. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I corrected myself. The smart kids. Smart kids. Me. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question, I think, that actually define some portion of that psychology when in your life the smart kids became the cool kids because it right like because I think the the more you were the cool kid in high school and then the nerd became the cool kid and you became the not cool kid the more you are a resentful uh part of this uh, this sort of uh, resentment cabal. Um, yeah. And the more you are kind of comfortable with your coolness uh, at the sort of midlife phase, the more likely you are to be a kind of complacent liberal. There's no doubt that Trump has a huge appeal to people that were cool in high school and are unhappy with how their life has turned out. Like that's just, and a lot of times it's not their fault, like particularly in certain communities that, you know, have been ravaged by, you know, op opioids and a lot of real reasons for this. In some cases, they just fucked up. Um, in some cases, just bad luck. Uh, but but uh, he definitely has an appeal to that mindset, particularly within men. Something that, I, that I've seen anecdotally and in focus groups. Kevin R., the mysterious Kevin R. Uh, yeah. Give us your thoughts. Um, yeah, so I was wondering how much of the problem in in your view or more more generally is Trump versus the Republican capture of the Senate and now it's becoming more obvious the Supreme Court where, I mean, it seems to me like the Constitution as written sort of expected that, yeah, you might end up with a really lousy president somebody who's doing a lot of bad things, but we've got all these nice checks and balances here that'll keep them in line. And sort of what's gone wrong is we, the factionalism which was feared in the Federalist Papers has arisen and now we've got a group that's putting party ahead of country. Yeah. Um, and this is part of the reason why I kind of I'm in the tribe that just can't go back to the party because the, the, you know the, these guys have just been too so complicit um, in the Senate in particular. <laughs> Uh, that said, I, you know, I, I do think Trump um, is, is the um, existential threat. Um, I, I don't know that, you know, um, uh, maybe I'm sure maybe this could be where uh, my, uh, people who've been watching who are like, are we sure this guy's a Republican? This might, this might remind them that I'm a Republican. I, I, I don't know that Mitch McConnell, you know, jamming up Joe Biden's um, policy agenda is really that bad of an outcome, right? I, I just, I, I don't, if the Senate is actually doing its job and, and kind of slowing the gears of government, 
like that doesn't really bother me that much. Um, the part of the part that you hit on that is extremely problematic is when they're not doing their job, particularly on oversight and the rule of law. And you got people like Marco, you know, who ran really for the Senate on the can on like vote for me, I will hold in check Trump or Hillary. Like that was Marco's campaign ads. And obviously none of those guys did that. And, and, and I think it's to all of their great um, shame. Uh, and, and I think that a lot of them know, know, know that they, you know, should be acting more on it. And, and that's why they're, they, you don't see them on TV anymore. Ken Landa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. So my question paints with a broad brush, and I know that. Um, among leadership, um, were norms, uh, Republican leadership were norms like appeals to personal morality, rule of law, constitutionalism, small C conservatism. Were they ever good faith? They certainly appear to have been thrown overboard right now, but have they always been code for other things or partisan wedge issues for political advantage? Great question. Um, I think that um, they were real for certain people. They certainly were real for the Bush family. Uh, you know, the Bush family has a lot of flaws um, and, you know, W made plenty of mistakes, but, that, but it was genuine. And I think that it's shown that since then. Um, I, I, I think that for a lot of other people, um, uh, you know, this was, um, it was, you know, I think there's a category of people for whom it was genuine and they just completely threw it away because it was less important to them than being able to golf with President Trump. Those are the most despicable people, I think. Um, and then there's another round category of people for whom it was code, I think, for, you know, sort of traditional values, white America um, and things of that nature. Um, uh, and so I, I think that there's a little bit from all from all three columns. Christopher, uh, you get the final question before Kate does the wrap up and uh, we uh, send Tim off riding off on a white horse into his wallpaper. That's a very big privilege. And my question comes really from a very maybe German perspective. I would like to know if um, you believe that if Trump loses, the peaceful transition of power is really in danger. I don't think so. Um, I, I was on an MSNBC panel, like when that, remember when the uh, uh, person wrote the anonymous op-ed? This was one of those big scandals that we don't even think about anymore. Um, it's gonna and, turn out to be Mnuchin. Yeah, and there was this big panel about like what is gonna happen right now. And the consensus on this panel, I don't want to out anybody, was that Donald Trump was going to use the levers of power of the DOJ to out this person. That there was, it was potentially leading to a you know vast takeover of power from the executive. A coup was coming, and I just I kind of was like, I don't know. I think he's going to just send some mean tweets about this and like <laughs> then, then like let it go. Um, and and so I, I sort of feel that way when people bring up. I, I think that there's good reason to be concerned about a lot of things that Trump is doing. There's good reason to, to, to try to put all the checks that we have on him that are po possible. Like, is he really gonna chain himself to the White House? I don't know. I think that he'll probably leave and send a lot of like really mean butthurt tweets and go on TV and accuse Joe Biden of being senile and uh, a criminal and you know say he should be put in jail and he'll probably run for president again. Um, maybe that's a topic for another, another one hour, um, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I do think he'll probably leave. I agree. I think the person who nailed the answer to this question about what if me? Trump refuses to leave was uh, Pete Buttigieg, who, whenever he was asked this question, would say, well, if he's willing to help out around the place, I suppose we could probably work <laughs> something out, which I always thought was just kind of nailed the, um, you know, uh, this is probably a subject for a different day, but there is more automaticity to the process of losing an election than people think there is. Um, okay. Uh, I would just like to say just for a second, like, I'm sorry, I'm like deep in constitutional law theory for this paper right now and everything else. And I'm reading Gordon Wood and like, there's been all of this, like, you know, I've just been thinking about this a lot and he has this line. I can't find it. I tried to find it, but like, he has this line about how like, how much of the culture, like how much like the culture of the constitution as we understand it today has nothing to do with what was actually being said at the time during like during the, during like the convention and during the drafting. Word. 
Yes. And how it's all about like kind of a cultural understanding and, and a, like an, and like an a, imbibe, you imbibe the norms of your culture and everything else shifts. Like when I was in high school, I remember so clearly the scandal around Ellen DeGeneres coming out as gay on the cover of Time magazine. And like my parents, like just being anti, like me coming out and my parents being anti-gay and like all of this stuff. And now it's like the sea change in two decades is incredible. Like it's just like, like it just it, a completely different world. So too has Trump done that to the presidency, but that doesn't mean that we can't like kind of recover and take it back. Like people are very flexible and I hope that like some of these things, but to this idea, the thing that Trump I think proves and Jack Goldsmith wrote this in a beautiful piece for the Atlantic is like the, like it's kind of norms all the way down. So much of the transition of power and the constitution and how things work between the branches is normative. There's just an understanding of civility and people aren't going to like, you know, do something completely so bad. I know we're over, but you don't think Trump's changed that semi-permanently? Oh, I mean, he might've, I only hope that he hasn't like, that's not like, to be fair. I just, I think that like, I, I remember waking up after the 2016 election and the biggest thing for me that was like weirdly like Hillary was, I was sad about Hillary, all of these things, no woman in the white house, this historic moment taken. But the thing that kind of kept coming to me was like, oh my God, he's going to get a presidential portrait in like the national portrait gallery and a library. Like he's going to like, no matter what happens, even if we like vote him out, he's impeached, whatever, he gets this legacy. And ugh, like, I was just so angry that he got that. Like, I was just like, you're so undeserving of any of that. Like, um, and, you know, but to your point, like, I think that, yes, I like he could have like, he could have permanently changed them. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Oh, bad. my God. You were not totally camera for that. Totally screenshotting that and making it the you the, can't because uh, he wasn't on camera with the YouTube. He wasn't. No, no, it. no. I'll get it off of YouTube and yeah. I'll use it as the uh, the thumbnail for the episode. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I know you'll appreciate that. So, anyways, Look, Tim, Tim, thank you so much. And I didn't need a rant at the end there. I just this like was kind awesome. of. You're yeah. a great American, fun. and uh, I wish uh, uh, one third of members of Congress could be one third as reflective as you have been in the last hour. Um, well, actually to that point, can we ask Tim if he's gonna run? You wanna run Tim? People- Hell no. Really? <laughs> Hell no, no, uh-uh. Never? No, be, like, who'd go for me? You're gonna well, be- I don't know, people who like smart- Trump cucks out there? I don't think I have a base. Who's you're my- You're gonna base? be like the new Chris Hitchens. That's, that's your future. That is your future. Yeah, See, totally people in the future. chat already would vote for you. Um, but you, seriously, chatters. yeah. I All mean, right. I don't know. More Kate, smart well, people. Well, we don't know who we have tomorrow, right? Tomorrow's a wild card? Yes. All right. Uh, so what's our back. sign off? <laughs> yeah, you come back anytime. Oh, man. Uh, that would be fun, actually. We could just do a double, like, do it back to back. That'd be really fun. Um, so, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the genre of people making things all about them and what they do and like casting aspersions at other people's interests and, and concerns, um, the university of Illinois entomologist May Barenbaum said of the worry over murder hornets, people are afraid of the wrong thing. The scariest insect out there are mosquitoes. People don't think twice about them. If anyone's a murder insect, it would be a mosquito. She then goes on to cite 15 deaths as reported by the Eastern Equine Encephalitis um, Association of Horses. Um, yeah. That have, like that are like all because of mosquitoes. Actually, this is true. The Bill and Melinda so Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation devotes almost like like two of their biggest, uh, two of their biggest things are measles vaccines and like nets for like the spread of disease. Well, when they get malaria. jailed by QAnon, we're going to be in big trouble from the, on the mosquito front. Exactly. It's going to be, it's the, the biggest beneficiaries of QAnon other than the reptiles, you know, the, the, the reptiles are like really into QAnon. Um, and I was offended because the QAnon people put together a tank uh, image with all the bad guys on it and I was not on it and um, 
Uh-huh. And I just was offended by that. But some of the people on the tank were reptiles. And I don't know what that's about, but the QAnon people think there are reptiles that are coming to eat us or something. Anyway, Kate, that's an excellent point. The, the true murder insect is the mosquito. The murder hornet is being maligned. We're going to have to Tim, update our update. Tim Miller, thank you so much for joining us. See you guys. All in the Super audience. Fun. This has been an unusually well attended episode, uh, particularly on YouTube. Uh, so share it, you know, and like spread the word about In Lieu of Fun because we're doing this like we're creeping up on our 50th episode. It'll be this week. And uh, I'm making a trailer. Then, up. I'm making funny things for you for our anniversary is our anniversary gift. My I'm anniversary super gift excited gift. about that. OK. <laughs> and until then, what's the sign off, Kate? Oh, no. Um, we can't have fun anymore, but. You in can, lieu of fun. In lieu of fun, you can still have us. I like literally just should write it down. I just wa- like watch <laughs> something and like I'm going to tape it to my computer screen. But anyways. Kate is the smartest person I know who can't remember a one line sign off. <laughs> in lieu of fun, you can still come and hang out with us. Bye, folks. Bye.